now they are leaving the land of Egypt, and they are moving over toward the Red Sea. And I want to begin reading here in chapter 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no leaven bread be eaten. As the children of Israel are now coming out of the land of Egypt, why, they have this given to them of the Lord. The firstborn in Egypt died. The gods of Egypt claim the firstborn. God, by the way, claims that. And we find, though, that he sometimes comes off very badly today. He claims the first from believers today. And again, I think that a great many do not give him that place that he should have. It's very important, by the way, to get this tremendous message before us that God claims the best, the very best, if you please. And here we find that he is claiming the firstborn. I think God claims the first in everything, and he wants to have first place in our lives. The problem has always been so many believers today put him last. They say, if I have time, I'll do this for the Lord. And they don't have time because they've been giving time to something that is their own, something that was for their own personal interest or amusement. There are those who say, yes, I'm going to give the Lord part of what I make if there's any left over. We always do that. I remember hearing Billy Sunday say years ago he was riding across the country with William Wrigley, the original William Wrigley, the man who really made the chewing gum and made the money from the chewing gum to begin with. And he was a Christian, and he told Billy Sunday on the train, he said, I've always made it a practice in my life to give the Lord a tenth of everything that I make And I don't give him the last tenth. I give him the first tenth. That's quite interesting of how God is blessed and prospered. And don't misunderstand me. God doesn't guarantee that to anyone. He hasn't promised that to anyone. But it's interesting how God has blessed men and women who have put him first. And when you put him first... May I say that that means you put him first. That's no mucking around, no compromising, no half-truth in saying that we put God first. He must come first. Now, the children of Israel, just as they are on the wilderness march, they've just come out of Egypt. And remember, they've been slaves. And God says to them, the firstborn belongs to me. And immediately, many of them could say, Well, look, Lord, you've just delivered us out of slavery, and now you're already claiming one of ours. Well, the Lord Jesus does the same thing for you and me today. He saves us out of the bondage of sin and delivers us and sets us free. And he says, If the Son make you free, you'll be free indeed. But wait just a moment. He also is saying that I want you to give yourself to me. Well, you say, I'm free. You are. You don't have to. But the important thing is, the blessing comes when we voluntarily come and put him first. That is something that they are having now to learn. I begin reading at verse 5 now of Exodus 13. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and the Jebusites, which ye swear unto thy fathers to give thee a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. In other words, they had observed the Passover feast and the feast of unleavened bread. Verse 6, Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day 
shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. Now, frankly, when they came out of Egypt, you remember, they took their kneading boards and the dough that was on it, and it was leaven. God says, I want you to get rid of that. They had to leave that back in the land of Egypt. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of the land of Egypt. In other words, this is to be passed from generation to generation that God had delivered them out of the land of Egypt. It shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand and for a memorial between thine eyes that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth, for with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in his season from year to year, and it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee, that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix, and every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast, the males shall be the Lord's. Now, the firstborn of all the stock that they had, that was true out in the field, that one tenth, and it was the first tenth, belonged to the Lord. And every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. You see, God didn't want one of these long-eared animals as an offering. It had to be the lamb. And if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck, and all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. They were to be redeemed, as we shall see later on, by silver. Silver was the redemption money. Now, he goes on to talk to them along this line. And let's look at this, because it's extremely interesting. It shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What is this? That thou shalt say unto him, By strength of hand the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth the matrix, being males. But all the firstborn of my children I redeem, and it shall be for a token upon thine hand, and for frontlets between thine eyes. For by strength of hand the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. Now, this is to remind them that God had delivered them out of the land of Egypt, and therefore the firstborn of their sons had to be redeemed by silver. We are told today that we're not redeemed by silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Now, verse 17, "...and it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the children go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Let peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt." Now, these people are just out of slavery, and they're not prepared for warfare at all. And the short way into the land, if you get your map and will note it, would be up the sea coast, would be up by the Mediterranean Sea, and that would take them right into the land. You remember in the Six-Day War, when Israel, you will recall, moved to the seacoast, and they moved the Egyptians out. They just came right down the seacoast. Well, of course, they were prepared. They had the tanks and the planes to do it. But these people are just out of slavery, and they do not have any instruments even to fight with. So God, very graciously, and notice how good he is to them. He takes them through the wilderness. It's a long route. 
but it will spare them from warfare. They'll not have to face an enemy until they do get into the land. Well, in 40 years, they will be equipped. They will have an army, as we're going to see, and they'll be prepared. But they're not prepared at this time. And somebody says, but God by miracle could have delivered them. True. But you see, there is today, I can't help but be sick when I see the attitude of some Christians. They feel like God's got to perform a miracle every minute for them and that you have a right to demand of the Lord that he intervene for you. If you're sick, he has to heal you and all that sort of thing. Well, my friend, he can do it. It's not a question of God's ability. It's always a question of the willingness of God and whether this is the way God wants to do it. Now, God could have brought them through the land of the Philistines, but he didn't want them at this time to be engaged in warfare and come up against it for the very simple reason they were not equipped for it. He could have delivered them. And when it's necessary, God's prepared to perform a miracle for us, but only to accomplish his will and his way in our lives. How we need to keep that in mind. Now, notice verse 18. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. Now, that word harness is a very interesting word. I guess in the Elizabethan days that it probably was quite meaningful to those people. But harness to us just means that they really were put under a yoke again. But that's not it. The whole thought is they went up orderly. They did not come out of Egypt as a mob. They were organized. They came out. They didn't have an army, but they certainly were organized. And it means by five in a rank. They lined up five in a row. And if you had seen them going through the wilderness, you'd probably seen the most orderly group that you've ever seen. Now, there's something else that's quite interesting here. It says, "...and Moses..." took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. Now, you will recall back in the book of Genesis, in fact, it's in the last part of the book of Genesis. It's the 50th chapter, and at that time I called attention to it that Joseph, when he died, He said unto his brethren, I die, and I'm reading now Genesis 50, 24, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of the land, unto the land which he sware to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. Now, That time has come. Quite a few years have gone by. At least 200 years have elapsed. And now there has arisen a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. He's no longer the national hero in the land of Egypt. He was at the time he died, but he's not now. Joseph knew that that would be true. They couldn't take him out of the land of Egypt and bury him at the time he died. So Joseph said, I want to be buried in that land. Now Moses took up the bones of Joseph to bury him in that land. Why remove his bones? What difference would it make if he's got a hope someday of being raised from the dead and taken up to heaven. Why, it wouldn't make any difference whether your launching pad was in Egypt or up in the land of Israel, where he's buried up in the Ephraim country. Well, the fact of the matter is, he expects to be raised in that land, for that land, for there is to be a resurrection of these people in that land for the millennium and then for eternity. That will be heaven for them. And that was the hope of Joseph. And this is the hope of Moses, you see. It's by faith that he does this. And then we're told, verse 20, "...and they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness." Now you'll find that they are moving now toward that wilderness 
and it's a frightful wilderness. Now again, notice what God does in verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillow of a cloud and led them the way and by night in a pillow of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillow of cloud by day nor the pillow of fire by night from before the people. Now these people crossed that hot and burning desert. And Moses himself called it a very frightening desert. But they went through it, and they didn't even get sunburned. But they had a pillow cloud over them by day. These people had something that no other nation has ever had. And this is the appearance of it now. And that is, they had the glory. And no other nation has ever had the visible presence of God. And that's the way that Paul, you'll recall, he defined the children of Israel. He raised the question, you'll recall, who are Israelites? That's in Romans 9, 4. To whom pertaineth adoption and the glory? These people had the glory, the visible presence of God. Now, no nation has ever had that. And the church does not have the visible presence of God. And these people that talk today about they've had a vision and they've seen something. The thing to do is when you have a vision, and I'm sure many of us do at night, we have a very vivid dream. The thing to do is not to try to feel that God is speaking to us in it, but to find out what we had for dinner. That's the explanation for it. It's not God speaking to us. It's the fact that we ate something for dinner we should not have eaten. And that's the explanation of it. But the church has nothing visible given to it. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. And we walk by faith. You see, these people are walking, looking to the coming of Christ. We look back to a historical event. And frankly, we do not need the visible presence of God to walk by faith. They did in that day because the redemption had not been worked out in history as it has for us today. So you see now God is making every preparation for every eventuality that will bring these people safely through the wilderness. That is the preparation that he's making. And actually, they're not really out of the land of Egypt. They are out of that fertile valley of the Nile and they have now hit the desert, and they're crossing over, coming now to the Red Sea. That brings us in chapter 14 to this particular section here. And I begin reading now in chapter 14. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihaharath, between Migdal and the sea, over against baal Zephon, before it shall ye camp by the sea. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know where these places are. I take it that they are there between the Nile River, where they left the land of Goshen, and the Red Sea. They moved into that area. Now, notice, though Pharaoh has let them go, he's still reluctant to let them go. Verse 3, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in. Now, he had, of course, spies watching their movement, and a movement of two and a half million people would be very difficult to conceal anyway. Now, he expected them to go up the coast route through the land of the Philistines. Now they are headed out toward this wilderness, and frankly, Pharaoh thinks they're lost, that they don't know where they're going, that no one would attempt to go through that dreadful wilderness. Now, notice, God says that when he sees that, why, he'll think the children of Israel are trapped, and he's going to go after them. Again, you see, he let them go reluctantly. Verse 4, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, that the Egyptians may know that I'm the Lord, and they did so. Now, you would think that what had already happened was enough. 
But believe me, something even more profound is going to take place that will convince the Egyptians. And now verse 5, it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. The heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people, and they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took six hundred chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. So that the host of Egypt is going with six hundred chariots. Now, you can imagine what 600 chariots would do to a poor, helpless, defenseless people, and especially women and children and cattle. Why, they would make havoc of them and make hash of them also. Now, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them in camping by the sea beside Pihahiroth before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Here is the Red Sea ahead of them, the hosts of Egypt back of them, and these poor defenseless people are caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. How are they going to get over? They have no means or method to defend themselves. They are not a warlike people, and they're not equipped to defend themselves at all. And so they are actually in a very bad spot. And I begin reading now at verse 10 of Exodus 14. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? That to us today is a rather ironic statement, and I'm sure it was more so in that day. The great pyramid stood there as a great burying place for kings, for pharaohs, and the mummies were all over the place to tell the truth in the land of Egypt. And the children of Israel are saying, Did you bring us out here because there wasn't room to bury us in the land of Egypt? Well, it was a great burying ground, by the way. And it has meant more, I think, to the study of the past and to Egypt to look into these different graves they found there. Now they think they're to be slaughtered out in the wilderness. And notice verse 12, "...is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness." Now they cried out in the land of Egypt. They wanted to be delivered. And now when the opportunity came, but here was the danger why they want now to turn and go back to the land of Egypt. Notice now what God is going to do for them. You must understand they're helpless, and they are hopeless without the aid of God. If they are to be redeemed, He will have to do it. And I only wish that we could get that objective viewpoint of ourselves. I wonder if you could move out yonder with the astronauts to the moon and look back at this little earth and look at the people that are on this earth, humanity. And humanity is in sin. Humanity is lost. This world today is actually a pretty hopeless place. It's a great burying ground. By man came death into this world. What a picture that you have here. Man's been on the march for over 5,000 years, 5,000 years plus. Where's he marching to? To the grave. This is not a pretty sort of thing. Man today is probably 
the greatest, or let me turn that around and say the most colossal failure in God's universe. And any way you look at him, he is. Man, by the very brevity of his life, is that. By the uncertainty of his life. That's the condition of man today. And look at these children of Israel. They'll never get out unless God moves in their behalf. And you and I could never be redeemed unless God did it, friends. Redemption is the work of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. Jonah said that. David said that. And that's the message of the New Testament, that salvation is of the Lord. Now notice verse 13 now. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You see, the Lord here is the one that will work in their behalf. All they have to do is to accept it and receive the salvation. They are to stand still. God will be the one that will move in their behalf. And my friend, you can't lift a little finger to work out your salvation. All you have to do is to accept what God has done for you. Now notice here as we move on, God says, "...fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians, whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever." In other words, you better tell them goodbye, because you're not going to see them anymore. Now, verse 14, "...the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace." That's the wonderful thing for us. It's God who worked. It's God who wrought our salvation, and he gives to us that peace that comes that our sins have been forgiven because of his redemption." Now, verse 15, "...and the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward." In other words, they are to stand still to see the salvation of the Lord. But now when it's wrought, they are to lay hold of it. And they'll lay hold of it by faith. And that will be evidenced in whether they go forward or not. "...but lift thou up thy rod, stretch out thine hand." over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea." Now, here is something that I'd like to call your attention to especially, because there have been so many natural explanations offered for how the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea. Now, I think it's pretty well established today. And I think all reputable and conservative historians and theologians agree that the exodus took place. It's a historical event. But how did they cross the Red Sea? And there are those that like to say that the wind is what blew the water back. But it was a wall of water on both sides. And of course, that pretty much eliminates just the idea that the wind blew the sea back. And yet we're going to find here that that is mentioned. Then there are those that attempt to offer the explanation that the thing that took place was some sort of a natural phenomena, that the sea was rolled back and some have even come up with an earthquake that took place at this moment, and they say that's the miraculous part of it. But the thing that you have to face is that a miracle is recorded here, and you either accept it or you don't accept it, and this is the historical record of their crossing the Red Sea. And it is, they shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Now, when they crossed over the Red Sea, friends, it was just like going across that desert. The sand was dry, and they didn't even get damp when they crossed the Red Sea. They just didn't get wet at all. Not a drop of water fell on them. 
they crossed over dry shod, we are told here. Now, that is important to see, and only a miracle would explain that. I was discussing this many years ago in the days when I was much younger and liked to argue about this with another young liberal theologian, and he was coming up with all kinds of explanations, and I think I stumped him with this. I said, how would you explain they went over dry shod? Now, I said, granted that the water was blown back, and granted that that took place. I said, wouldn't you agree that the sand would be a little wet, and they probably got their feet wet, When they went over, maybe had to take off their sandals. But it says they went over dry shod. There wasn't enough water there for them to even get their feet down. May I say to you, that's pretty hard to explain, is it not? Unless you're willing and prepared to believe that there are miracles in the Word of God. Now, will you notice verse 17? And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts and upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. Now, had you been at the water's edge when Pharaoh started to follow the children of Israel across the Red Sea, and you would have said to him, I suppose that you recognize you're doing this, all of you Egyptians, because your heart's been hardened and you really don't want to go. Well, I think they would have laughed at you, said, we're going over because we want to go. The thing is, God is forcing them to do the thing that's in their heart, and that is the hardening of it, as we saw in the land of Egypt. Now, verse 18, "...and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen." Now, when it says, "...the Egyptians shall know..." It doesn't mean the crowd that attempted to go across the Red Sea, the horsemen and Pharaoh. It means the people left back in the land of Egypt, because that crowd crossing the Red Sea just not going to know. Verse 19, "...and the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them." This is interesting to note. I believe the angel of the Lord here is none other than the pre-incarnate Christ, by the way. And I'll be calling attention to that from time to time. Verse 20, "...and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all that night." In other words, God stood between them. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Now, that's important to see. A natural wind would never have made a wall on both sides. Now, I'll grant that a wind might have blown the water to one side, if they had been near the bank, but to cross it and to make a way across with a wall of water on both sides, a natural wind doesn't do that, friends. Verse 22, "...and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them." to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the hosts of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the hosts of the Egyptians. The interesting thing to note here is God worked through the pillar of fire and the cloud. And I think this represents the Holy Spirit. God works through the Holy Spirit. He does today. And here you find Him moving through the Holy Spirit, or through the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And they were led, as the child of God should be led today, by the Spirit of God. 
Now, verse 25, "...and took off their chariot wheels, that they drave them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians." Now, it was clear to them that what was happening was certainly supernatural. And they now want to escape, and they turn and try to retreat. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. Now, and I've read all of this purposely, because this is an account that needs to be looked at rather closely as we've attempted to do this, that what you have, friends, is a miracle. Now, there's no natural way of explaining it. And I recognize that we have many good men today. And when I say good, they're conservative men. They believe in the Word of God, and they believe they're saved by faith alone in Christ. But they want to explain this in some natural way. I don't think that when you read this record that you could do that. God says, here's a miracle. You either take it or you leave it. And I think that's the way he puts it down in his word. Now, notice verse 29. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Now, don't you see that this is a miracle? Twice now this has been made clear to us. They walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them, their right hand and their left. You can't explain that on a natural basis. Verse 30, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Now, you see, this was the purpose of this, that at the beginning of this wilderness march, they now see the power of God. He delivered them by blood out of Egypt. He delivers them by power. And now that is demonstrated as they cross the Red Sea. Now, when they cross the Red Sea, they join in a song. And this is something I'd like for you to note. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spoke, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. And listen to Israel sing now. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. My, they're singing lustily now. Is this the same crowd, friends, that were over on the other side? of the Red Sea, and they were moaning and crying out and wanted to go back to Egypt and said, weren't there graves enough there for us? And you bring us out here to die. What has happened? Well, we're told back in 1 Corinthians 10, now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age are come. Now, what is it that we have here? Well, listen to Paul, and I'll move back in 1 Corinthians 10, and I read then verse 11. I'll read verse 1 now. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. 
Now, how were they baptized under Moses? Well, here it wasn't water. I'm sure you understand that. Because when we go back and read this, the children of Israel went over dry shod. They didn't get a drop of water on them. They didn't get enough to dampen a washcloth to wash their faces with. And yet the Egyptians, they really got wet. They got soaked through and through. And if you're talking about water, it wasn't Israel. It was the Egyptians. But what does it mean they were baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea? It means they were identified. And we'll have occasion when we get to the New Testament to see that the primary meaning of baptism is identification. And the ritual baptism is the baptism of water. And I believe it's essential and important. It sets forth the real baptism, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit identifies us with Christ and puts us in Christ. Now, how were these baptized under Moses? Well, they were complaining on one side, and when they got on the other side, they sang the song of Moses. They're now identified with him. They've been delivered with him by faith. We read now in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, by faith they crossed the Red Sea, which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. By faith. Whose faith? Their faith? Oh, no, friends, they didn't have any until they crossed over. They were identified with Moses, and it was Moses' faith. It was Moses who smote the Red Sea. It was Moses who led them across. It was Moses, when they got to the other side, that lifted the song of deliverance and began to sing, and now they have seen the salvation of God, and they are identified now with Moses. They've been baptized under Moses. And friends, that is what happens when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. He is the one that takes us out of the Egyptian bondage and the Egyptian darkness of this world. He leads us across the Red Sea of His deliverance, of His salvation, of His redemption, and He brings us to the place where we can lift a song of redemption unto Him, and we are joined to Him. We are baptized into Christ. That's very important for a child of God to see. By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. The Holy Spirit is the one that joins us to Christ, and we become one with Him. And friends, that's a wonderful thing, to be joined to Him. The dear little lady, when she was talking about she had the assurance of her salvation, why they said, why don't you know you talk about that nobody can take you out of His hand? Well, you might slip through His fingers. And she said, oh my, no, I couldn't slip through His fingers. I'm one of his fingers. We are members of the body of Christ, friends, and the Spirit of God joins us to him. What a glorious, wonderful redemption that we have in Christ. All of these things happen unto them for examples to us. Here's a picture of our redemption and what the Spirit of God does when we trust the Lord Jesus as our Savior. After crossing over, they now join with Moses singing the song of Moses. Before, they were singing the blues, the desert blues. And they'll be returning to the desert blues. That was their theme song when they went through the desert. But right now, having crossed over and been redeemed, why, they very lustily sing out the song of Moses. I'll merely lift out several things in this song because we want to continue to move along. This song is to be compared, I think, with the song of Deborah and Barak that we'll be coming to in the book of Judges. Then you'll recall that David sang many songs. You'll find that his psalms are great, great songs. And you'll find that even Jeremiah, his was a wail and a woe, many times, but he had a song. And you'll find that other prophets had songs as we move along through the Old Testament. 
The New Testament opens with some songs. Dr. Luke records them. There was the song, actually, of Elizabeth, when word was brought that she was to have a child. There was the song of Mary, the marvelous, wonderful song that she sang. There were other great songs connected with the birth of Christ. And finally, there was the heavenly hosts with their tremendous pean of praise. And then the book of Revelation, when we get a glimpse into heaven, why we see a great company gathered around the throne of God, and they're singing a new song. And that'll be probably the first time I'm going to ever sing. Up to the present, I've never been able to hit a note. But by that time, with a new body and a new voice, I'm sure I'll be able to sing and join in on the new song. Now, notice this song. It's a wonderful one, by the way. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he's become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is, or Jehovah, is a man of war. The Lord is his name. All of this talk about peace today. It might be well to read this song again. And the one who is Jehovah is a man of war. Then turn to the 19th chapter of Revelation. You see him coming to this earth, and he's going to come to put down all unrighteousness. And friends, until that time, this earth will never have peace. And it can be truly said that God is, and the Lord Jesus, that he is a man of war. Our Lord said he didn't come to bring peace, but a sower. That's what he did the first time. The second time, he's coming to bring peace with the sower, because that's the only way you're going to get rid of unrighteousness on this earth. Now, this is a song like so many of them. It recounts the wonderful experience they've had in crossing the Red Sea and what they've seen God do. I think, and I know very little about music, but I think these folk songs today do that same sort of thing. And I don't mean their praise to God, but they do recount an episode that takes place. That makes a song meaningful, and I'm not sure, but what that is the reason that songs have affected the young people so much today. That is this current type of music, which to me is atrocious, but after all, I'm just a square. But the songs do tell a story. Now, this song is a story that it tells. It gives the account of the crossing of the Red Sea, something that they were not apt to forget, but this song certainly kept it before them. And it is a song that tells of what God has done for them. And we can't go into a great deal of detail here. Notice he says, Pharaoh's chariots and his hosts hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. They're celebrating their deliverance, you see. The Egyptians and Egypt represented for them the slavery that they were in in the world, their hopelessness, their helplessness. And now they've been delivered. They have been redeemed. And that is the sum and substance of their song. And then in verse 11, and I'll drop down, "...who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods?" Now, they've come out of a land of idolatry, and we've seen the battle of the gods, each one of these plagues leveled against them. All right, what is the conclusion they've come to now? "...who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods?" No comparison. "...who is like thee, glorious in holiness?" fearful in praises, doing wonders. Now, God was teaching then his people a great lesson concerning himself. And he says, Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swalloweth them. And verse 13, Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. You see, they were a redeemed people. 
There had to be the redemption of the people. And that is the thing that's important today. God is not asking you to do one thing for him, friends, until you've been redeemed, until you've accepted his salvation. And he's not asking you for anything. God has the world today shut up to a cross. And he's not demanding of the world to do something. He's not saying, now, if you'll improve yourself and come up a little higher standard, wash your face, rake your yard, and put up a good front, God says, I'm willing to be your good neighbor. That's not it. God's not asking the world for anything. God has the world shut up to a cross. And he's saying to a lost world, what will you do with my son who died for you? Listen again to verse 13. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength under thy holy habitation. Just as if they're already in the land. And as far as God is concerned, they are, because he's going to take them there. Then they recount their experiences here and what they've seen. Over in verse 18, "...the Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea. And the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea." Now we're introduced to a girl we haven't seen since the birth of Moses. Verse 20, "...and Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea." So you can see that there's great praise and thanksgiving to God for his deliverance. Now, verse 22, "...so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water." Now, friends, we're beginning here something that I want you to pay particular attention to because what we have, and I have put it in our notes and outlines, marching to Mount Sinai, and it was at Mount Sinai that they got the law. And here you have in chapters 15 through 18 seven experiences that these people had along the way. And these seven experiences correspond to Christian experience today. Remember, all of these things happen unto them for examples unto us. And you see the spiritual education that God gave these people. So here in this section, especially verse 22, why we find in the wilderness of Shur that they are certainly not on a bed of roses. You can put that down. There's no bed of roses here for them at all. And that's very important to see. Now, let me call your attention to this again. They crossed over now, and they had this wonderful time of praise singing the song of Moses. And they're redeemed people. But notice what happened. Well, you would think that from now on, they would be on a bed of roses, all the stones would be removed, and that they would not have any problem at all. You would think that since they are redeemed, they'd be delivered from all their difficulties, that not a cloud would be in the sky, not a thorn would be along the way, and there would not be a sigh. Well, what happened? They thirsted. They went three days in the wilderness, and they found no water. And what happened to them? This is a pretty howdy-do, is it not, to have this happen to God's people? And after all, it's a legitimate experience. Egypt had been a land of plenty. There was water in abundance. And quite suddenly, they've crossed the Red Sea and they find themselves in different circumstances. That water was not available anymore. The cisterns of Egypt are gone, and they have not found the fountains of living waters. And I believe that this is the experience of every born-again child of God. 
after redemption, he finds that the cisterns of Egypt do not satisfy at all. And there is a period of soul thirst. And it's that period in which Paul said, "...what things were gained to me I counted loss." And then the great apostle reveals a great thirst, a great yearning. He says, "...that I might know him and the power of his resurrection." That is the experience, I think, of a child of God after you've been redeemed. I wonder if I may give you a personal experience. I remember when God put his hand definitely upon me and I came to know the peace of God through trusting Christ. And then I wanted to study for the ministry and I had been living. I worked in a bank and traveling with a pretty fast crowd. Thought I was having a great time. I was actually chairman of the dance committee. And in those days, they always had to have bootleg liquor to dance. And I decided that I wouldn't break off all of a sudden. I would go to that dance that night. I wouldn't dance. I'd just stand in the stag line. I'd just sort of visit around. And I'd make a gradual break. And I went and I was offered a drink, I suppose, a dozen times. And I turned it down, and I never shall forget. I met a fellow at the bank. I had been put ahead of him, and he had never forgiven me for it. And it was my fault because I wasn't the one that had charge of the bank. And he always took advantage of every opportunity. And so he came up to me while I was standing in that stag line. He says, this is a pretty place for a preacher to be. And he used some pretty strong language when he said that to me. And I came to the conclusion, he is right. And so I never shall forget. Like a little whip dog, I went down the stairway, and I went out on the street, and I could hear that orchestra playing in the distance. And you know that I almost turned around and went back up there, and I was going to look him up and say, look here, I think I'm just going to stay here with the gang, with the crowd. But thank God it didn't. You know, there's always that trip into the wilderness after you're saved, When you get a little thirsty, friends, the cisterns of Egypt, they just won't satisfy you anymore. And you are looking for living waters, and I didn't know where to find them, to tell the truth. I knew very little about the Bible. I could not find my way around in it at all. But may I say to you, I soon found out that there had been one who John says in John 7, 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, The Lord Jesus, you remember, stood and said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. What a wonderful thing it was to come to him. And then that was their first experience they had. And then they had a second experience that wasn't much better. And verse 23, listen to this. And when they came to Marah, and Marah, It's not only the name of a place, it means bitterness. They could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord. And the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee." Now, here is their second experience. It's at Marah, and there were bitter waters when they got there. Just think of it. They've gone three days in the wilderness without water, and they're thirsty. And when they finally come to them, they're bitter waters. And now you must remember, these are redeemed people, and this place was right on the line of march. God had it marked out for them. You know, the oasis of Marah is a normal Christian experience. A bitter experience comes to Christians, and it's something that'll puzzle and perplex you. 
You hear this said today, why does God let this happen to me? Well, friends, I can't tell you why, but I can say this. He's not punishing you. He's educating you. He's preparing you for something. In the world, our Lord says you're going to have trouble. It's right on your pathway. There's a Mara. And I think that in the pathway of every believer, there is a Mara. And he arranged it. Someone has said, as you know, disappointments are God's appointments. I hear this, and these are the things I've come across. A young person says to me, I wanted to go to school. I wanted to prepare for the mission field, but this tragedy or this came up. My father died, and I couldn't go to school. I had to help support my mother. And I recall that when I was past in Nashville, there was there a very beautiful, gray-haired, prematurely gray, because she was a young woman, and she was superintendent of the junior department, never complained, sweet. And I asked somebody one day, I said, what's the explanation of why her hair is gray like that? And this was way long time ago. They said, you remember World War I? Well, she was engaged to one of the finest boys here in the church, and He went away to France, and he was killed, and her hair turned gray because they were to be married. There was that Mara in her life. Friends, there are the frustrations and the disappointments and the sorrows, and your plans can just be torn up like a jigsaw puzzle. And it could be that there's a little grave out yonder on a hillside somewhere. I have one like that. May I say to you that we all have our maras, and you won't bypass them. As a Christian, you can't detour them, you can't skip over them, and you can't tunnel under them. May I say to you, don't let the seed be choked out by the thorns or the cares of the world. Don't let them choke it out. You know, God does use a brand and iron. I remember as a boy in West Texas, in the spring of the year when those calves would come in, they'd brand them, and you'd hear the little old fella, Bella, oh, you could hear him cry. It did sort of, you know, make you feel sad. But you know who he belonged to after that. And it was done that he wouldn't get lost. And God does that for us today. You know, what is it that will help the matters? We're told here that was a tree put in the water, and it made it sweet. And I'm told that concerning my Lord, that cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. And he died on a tree, and it's that cross that makes the experiences of life sweet. He tasted death for every man, and he took the sting out. O oh, death, where is thy sting? And we sometimes sing, Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for you and there is a cross for me. It's the cross of Christ that will make the bitter experiences of life sweet, my beloved. And then the final verse, And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Believe me, this was a marvelous place. Seventy palms and twelve wells of water. And Elam suggests abundant blessing and fruitfulness. You see, after Mara, God brings his children to Elam. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And Simon Peter may be locked in the inner prison, but the angel's going to open the door for him. And Paul and Silas may be beaten at midnight, but they're going to sing praises at midnight, and the doors are going to open. There's always Mara along the pilgrim pathway today, but friends, there's also Elam, the place where there's abundance of water, twelve wells of water and seventy palm trees. And you know, God's plan of usefulness always leads by Mara and by Elam. Joseph, you remember, had that experience. Moses did. Elijah did. David did. 
and Judson did, and John G. Payton did, and Micaiah Formosa did. And I'm sure that you and I are going to have that. Beyond every Mara, there is an Elam. Beyond every cloud, there's the sun. Beyond every shadow, there's the light. Beyond every trial, there is a triumph. Beyond every storm, there is a rainbow. George Matheson wrote, I trace the rainbow through the rain. This is the way God leads us today, friends. All these things happened unto them for examples unto us. Now we come here in chapter 16 to the wilderness of Zen. And here we have the manna and the quail. And we find that Christ is the bread of life. But now let me begin to read into this chapter here. And we're going to say something today about manna. They took their journey from Elam... And all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Zin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Now, they haven't been out there but about two and a half months since they left Egypt. And they started murmuring when they came to the Red Sea. But when they crossed over as they did, they sang the song of Moses. But it wasn't long now until they began to murmur. And you find they're going to sing the desert blues. Our commonplace word for it today is they griped. And I tell you, they were a bunch of gripers. Now will you listen? The children of Israel said unto them, would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Now, they don't mean a word of that, but they're griping. They wanted out of Egypt. They wanted to be delivered. But now that they've come out of Egypt and they've come out into that wilderness and they've run short of water, it's not plentiful. And they've run short now of food. And they began to complain. And they remember those flesh pots down there in Egypt, how it was. How many folk have been saved out of sin? And you have wanted to go back, haven't you? <laughs> I know that there are a great many that have had that temptation. A man told me in Nashville, he said, I was a bootlegger and I drank heavy. And he said, then I was converted. And he said, I knew where every bootlegging joint in Nashville was. And he says, the first few months of my conversion, I wouldn't dare go by one of those places because I knew I'd go in. And he said, I look back at those old flesh pots. But he said, thank God today I hate them. And there came a day, and these people hated those flesh pots of Egypt. Now, will you notice verse 4? Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold... I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. God said, I'll take care of them. They're not going to starve to death. I'm going to lead them through the wilderness. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily." And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel at even, Then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. And in the morning... Now notice this is verse 7 now, chapter 16. And in the morning, Then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? Moses and Aaron said, Why do you murmur against us? We're just human. We can't do anything. We can't provide for you. And God has heard your murmurings. And you will find out that the glory of God, friends, every time they murmured, the glory of God appeared. That reveals the fact that God doesn't like griping Christians today either. How many people that are Christians and all you hear from them is a continual griping? They're complaining. 
fault-finding. We have people in the church. I know today a half a dozen preachers who have ulcers. And they have ulcers because they've got a few board members or the president of a missionary society or a choir director or somebody in a church that is nothing in the world but a murmurer, a griper, a complainer, a fault finder. And may I say this to you very candidly, God doesn't like it, friends. If you have to murmur and complain and gripe in the church, get out and go somewhere else and give somebody else the ulcer where you go, because you'll take ulcers wherever you go. There are a lot of folk like that today. And God made it very clear here he didn't like it. Now I read on in verse 8. And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him, And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. And friends, you ought to be very careful when you begin to gripe about things in the church. Are you really griping about that you don't like the way the preacher does? He's not as friendly as he should be, didn't shake hands with you last time, hadn't been around to visit you, and you were murmuring about it. Really isn't the reason that you're against him is because... He teaches the Word of God, and he represents God in your church. You're really murmuring, aren't you, against God? And may I say that sometimes we preachers murmur too. And may be that for the same reason, we better be careful we're not murmuring against God. This is one thing that God just somehow or another doesn't like. And Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. It came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the cap, and in the morning the dew lay round about the house. Now, God gave them quail to eat, and quail on toast, our quail on manna, was mighty good eating, friends. Now let me read at verse 14, because manna is that which was their sustenance when they went through the wilderness. Verse 14, And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoar frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It's manna. For they knew not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, and so on. Now we find that they were to gather it, but just enough for the day, because God would supply it every day. But, of course, before the Sabbath day, they would get enough for the Sabbath, but it would not appear then. And verse 20, "...notwithstanding they hearken not unto Moses, but some of them left of it until the morning. It bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth or angry with them. And they gathered it every morning, every man, according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted." It was to be gathered every morning. And each man was to gather it. You see, this was to be a personal experience. Now, this speaks of Christ as the bread of life. And before we go any farther, I think we should establish that. Because over in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John, the Lord Jesus said, beginning at verse 32, "...then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven." But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Who is the true bread? Well, manna 
is that which represents Christ as the bread of life who came down from heaven to give his life for the world. This does not represent him as the one we're to feed on daily, but it does represent him as being the one that gives us life and gives us sustenance. And the very interesting thing is, we'll find when they got to the book of Numbers, that during the 40 years that their feet did not swell. That's interesting to note. A doctor, a medical missionary in the Philippine Islands told me, he says, the foot swells and very, very out in the Orient because people have only one diet. And he says that caused foot swelling. The very interesting thing is that the manna had all the vitamins in it. Their foot didn't swell going through the wilderness. It was all that they needed. It was adequate to meet all their needs. Now, uh, again, I want to follow down in this and just lift out that which is important as it relates to the manna. And we are told, I'll begin reading at verse 25, And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it. But on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, In it there shall be none. Now, the Sabbath day, you see, was given to them before it was given in the commandments, before it became a law to them. Verse 31, And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. How would you describe manna? Well, may I say to you, I do not know exactly how to explain it. I think it was a wonderful food. It contained all the vitamins. I think that it tasted like about anything you wanted it to taste like. I think it was a very exciting food. No question about that. And do you know that it was manna that started the mixed multitude complaining? I want to turn over to an incident in the 11th chapter of Numbers, which we need to look at here to properly understand manna. I read it beginning verse 4 of the 11th chapter of Numbers. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a-lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. This, my friend, is what they missed in the land of Egypt. And everything they missed here was that which grew on the ground or under the ground. And they were all condiments. None of them had real nourishment in it, like the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. And believe me, friend. When you eat all these things, you certainly are not very attractive. Someone has said an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but an onion a day keeps everybody away. This is something made them very unattractive, not very appealing. These are the things that the people of the world eat, and they do not satisfy. You can see that it's nothing in the world but condiments. And the mixed multitude, they remembered what they had in Egypt, and they wanted that food. And notice verse 6, "...but now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes." They said, "Why there's nothing to eat but manna. And every time they complained about it, and here is the second description that's given of it, is here in verse 7, and this is what we were after. "...and the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof is the color of bedelium." It's as if God is saying here, or the Spirit of God is saying, look, this is what the people despise. They got tired of eating fried chicken and ice cream and angel food cake. Well, that's what the manna was all wrapped up in one. And notice, it wasn't a monotonous food. Notice this here, verse 8. And the people went about and gathered it. Now, notice what they could do. They ground it in mills, or beat it in a mortar, or baked it in pans, and made cakes of it, and the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. Now, 
Friends, manna wasn't monotonous. They could fix it every way that was imaginable. They could grind it up. They could beat it in a mortar. They could bake it in pans. Why, they could make a casserole of it. Oh, I think that there must have been out in that day Mother Moses' cookbook, a thousand and one recipes and different ways to fix manna. My, it wasn't monotonous at all. And this is what the children of Israel despised and complained. And this is what God gave them to eat on the wilderness march. Now, I'm turning back now to the 16th chapter of the book of Exodus and reading at verse 31. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. You know why they called it manna? What is it? (laughs) And the question is today, who is he? And whom do man say that I, the Son of Man, is? He's the manna that came down from heaven to give life to the world. And that's the way God gave life to these people on the wilderness march. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. It must have been delicious, but they got tired of it. It was monotonous to them. And they long for those flesh pots down in the land of Egypt. My, how they went back to that. That is the story, I'm afraid, of some people that have been converted. And they have been delivered out of the land of Egypt. But they every now and then make a side trip back to get the leeks, the onions, and the garlic of the land of Egypt. There are Christians today that need to make a break in their life. Friends, you can't go on living like the world. You can't go on eating the food of Egypt and living on the things of Egypt and be serviceable for God and to live for God and have the peace of God in your heart. There must be a break with Egypt and there must be a living on the true manna that came down from heaven, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 32, And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commandeth. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness, when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot, put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. And by the way, friends, A pot of manna was put in the ark. We'll be coming in the last part of Exodus to the building of the tabernacle. And in the ark there was placed three things. Aaron's rod that budded, the manna, and also the Ten Commandments. The law speaks of the fact that he alone kept the law, that he has fulfilled it for you and me. And the second thing is the Manna speaks of his death for us, that he has provided the spiritual food for us. And Aaron's rod that budded speaks of his resurrection. And over that was the mercy seat. The blood was put on the mercy seat. He alone was able to meet the demands of God. And he alone is able to save, and he saves because The blood has been shed, and God's prepared now to extend mercy to sinner man. Now we read, And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came into the borders of the land of Canaan. Now an omer is the tenth part of an ephah. And that is practically meaningless to me because all it does is give the daily rations that each one had. The important thing, I think, for us is that for 40 years they ate it. Now, when they came into the promised land, you will find that the manna ceased and they ate the old corn of the land. And again, they complained about the old corn when they got there. Because after all, manna really was an exciting food. It was exotic food. But old corn is not so exciting. The very interesting thing is there are a great many people that live on experience. They've been saved, converted. 
They've been to the cross. It speaks of the death of Christ. And they just keep talking about their experience, their experience. And you hear these that just give their testimony. And that's all they have to give is a testimony. They never get to eat the old corn. In other words, they don't like Bible study because, after all, it's just old corn. And that's what this is that we're having here. I'm sorry to have to say it, but we just have old corn here. And every now and then I do dish out a little corn. And I mean, it's really corny. But the Word of God, friends, is old corn. And that's what God wants to feed us on today. But if you haven't had a taste of manna yet, I'd suggest you come to Christ and taste of the manna. He says, taste of the Lord and see that he is good. He says, I'm the bread of life that came down from heaven to give my life for the world.